Hello, and welcome to Makers.dev, episode number 33. Chris, have you been to any picnics recently, and do you have <laughs> plans to go to one soon? Uh, yes, I do, actually. So, <laughs> oh. yes. <laughs> We have uh, we have family in town, and we're going to do a picnic this afternoon in the park. It is no longer 90 degrees here. Big storm front came through, and now it's only 70-something. So it should be a nice picnic in the park this afternoon. Lovely. It uh, is at least 90 degrees in Dallas. 90 degrees would be preferable to, to what we have. It's hot and humid, and without this ERV, uh, I would not be able to open any sort of door or window. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad I have the solution to get fresh air. But my gosh, it's just... You walk outside and you're walking into a shower that's hot and steamy and uh, it's not fun. I'm trying to collapse all my outdoor time to be like in the beginning or, or uh, end of the day. Uh, I have some AI questions I'd love to ask you about, specifically about self-driving cars. Uh, but cool. I'll save that for later. First, what you get up to this last week? What uh, I think we, we talked about like math AI stuff and the, the uh, AI stuff. What, what did you get up to? Yeah, so I did um, none of that. <laughs> um, I did. So I did some more Kaggle, um, and then we have family in town, like I mentioned. And so, it, it even though I'm working for part of the day, it is surprising how much just having extra people in the house, you know, uh, mm. changes what things are going on. So we have two kids. Um, this is my wife's sister, so she has one kid. So now there's three kids in the house, um, and we're trying to like you know do something interesting with the kids every day. And so it just became a lot of planning and doing stuff and. Um, yeah, and then um, so there's that, and then on the cattle competition, I'm sort of stuck, and we can talk about that if you want. I'm kind of stuck in a way where I have several avenues where I could continue going, but I have zero, you know, zero reason to believe any of them will pan out. Like I don't, it, I'm stuck in a place where I, I have no obvious next path, and so yeah, do I switch competitions? Do, like stop doing this competition? Do I try lots of those paths even though it might waste time? Uh, yeah, and then I stopped prep for the masters, which starts this fall. So I'm doing some more math stuff, but um, I have not published any any of my you know learning about that, which is what I want to do also. So yeah, it's sort of a busy week. Uh, yep, I had a very similar week, and I think this is an important point of this sort of lifestyle that I think we're both embodying of flexibly pursuing the work that we're most excited about and living within our means enough that money is uh, like <laughs> neither of us I think are, are concerned about. Uh, running out of money. There there are several safety guards uh, in place of that. We can just take a week and like spend it with family and spend it with kids. Uh, for me, I went to a wedding with Sarah and like most of the week was just about that. It was a nice road trip and got to talk to her and got to hang out at the wedding and uh, <laughs> went on this uh, slide in this water park where you, it's like a four-story slide with a ramp on the end and I learned oh, from this 12-year-old kid how to do a backflip off the end of it by putting my knees up into my chest oh it was amazing uh and like yeah that's part of life it's it's not all about making stuff it's about like having the space to be able to, to pursue whatever the thing is that you want i would much rather have a clear table in my life than have you know maximally making use economically of every square inch of the table because invariably you know having that sort of flexibility and being able to make space and fill it with the the most exciting or, or the most important thing uh, in the moment leads to a, a better, richer life. Uh, so that's that's cool. Uh, you get to hang out with three kids uh, and <laughs> go on picnics and things. Uh, I would love to dig into the no obvious next step on Kaggle. Uh, that's a position that I find myself in frequently of just sort of feeling stuck and feeling like the next step is not clear uh, and that like I could bang my head against the wall and try different things and spin my wheels and you know if if i was employed in a job and that's the thing i was doing and sort of feel obligated to do that uh how are you framing that and, and what's the position that you find yourself in yeah so uh, so the competition i'm doing is a little unlike other ones um because it so it's about gps and the the baseline that they gave was like using a pretty standard gps algorithm and so you're tasked with like beating a pretty standard gps algorithm and um I did some things I got, you know, better than it. Uh, and then a bunch of people caught up with me. So, you know, there's kind of like mm, 10 of us are top. So at the top of the leaderboard that seems to have figured out kind of the same things. Um, but I know the competition has a lot longer to go. And I know that there is a next step past this that people are going to get to. Um, and I can kind of see that direction, but every time I try to like inch into that, <laughs> into that, like, um, uh, direction, I just, I, my results are worse. Um, mm -hmm. I can't even like, with things that I think should be better, I can't even meet the baseline that they gave us. Mm -hmm. And so 
it's like like I have a several more ideas but I could spend hours and hours and get absolutely nowhere um, which is kind of different than traditional development I think like development like um, you at least can get somewhere <laughs> like you can at least make the next feature I mean it, it sort of feels like I'm tracking down like a bug where you like know there's an answer but it might take you know two hours or two months and you don't know which one it is and it's like super mm -hmm. super frustrating because that like I don't I can't even get it like an idea that I'm in the right direction because I just keep getting worse results. So I just keep getting a lot of like, Oh, don't do it that way. Don't do it that way. Don't do it that way. Mm. Um, yeah. I don't know. How, how do you get past when you feel like that? That's, this is sort of like the core problem of intelligence. The way you're defining this, it, it sounds to me so much like, uh, I love the analogy of a, a little bug that's trying to find the highest point in its space. So, you know, it's an ant crawling and the ant has to find the highest place to get to go to so it can do ant things. I don't know. It's not fully fleshed out. <laughs> the, the bug's trying to get higher. And if you imagine sort of a topological thing and th there would be little small hills and if the ant's logic was like, ah, go, just just go uphill from wherever you start, the ant's going to find that local maxima and just based on luck, uh, that might actually be the highest place it could go to or it might have just found a, a small bump before the, the huge mountain. And that's a really hard problem. Like it's trivially easy in that sense for humans because, okay, we have vision, we can see in this other dimension and we can like look up and see, oh, well, that's a higher hill. And even though I'm going downhill now, and even though I'm, I have to take this really roundabout way, I, I know where I'm going. I, I can see the higher place to get there. But when you apply this, if, if, if you think about, functionally, that's what you're doing here. You, you have a loss function that you're trying to minimize in this very complicated n-dimensional space. Uh, and you don't know the shape of that space uh, and you don't quite have a map of where you are right now. Like, my gosh, I, th th what a complicated problem. Uh, and I guess it's made a little bit better for you in this specific context, because you know that it's possible. You, you know that there are people who are higher than you. You're uh, in the analogy of the ant, like the ant has the, <laughs> it, it is getting reports of how high all the other ants have gotten. Uh, it's a, in in a sense, this is sort of the core problem of like intelligence of navigating the world. Uh, so I think I think that's the first thing I would say is like, yeah, that's really hard. <laughs> and the, 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 not knowing the shape of the place where you're going or even how to move in the different different dimensions. Uh, that's that's sort of why these competitions ex exist. Like no one is no one's figured out yet how uh, these these things work or how to how to move in different directions to map the entire space uh so you know that, i think that's how it's supposed to feel to to solving the problem the thing that i find related to this life flexibility the thing that i find helps me the most in this sort of situation is taking time away from it if i feel stuck i i just like do something else uh, i'm reminded of uh a story of Leonardo da Vinci that I'd heard, I can't remember from where of, how uh, he would just be jumping between projects like mad. He'd, he'd go and like, you know, spend a couple hours painting the Mona Lisa and then he'd be like, ah, the smile doesn't look quite right. And then he'd go and invent a helicopter. And then he'd go and like, you know, draw the anatomy of the human skull. Uh, and by popping between the different projects, he's maximizing subconscious time to be working on them. And that's where the, the unexpected uh, revelations will come of you know if you're the ant and you take a little nap or you you do a little ant thing farm some aphids or something uh that's maximizing the chances of serendipity and minimizing the work that you're doing you're not you're not trying to push a boulder uphill you're sort of like dancing around the boulder trying to figure out if there's a, a better way around it uh and then as soon as things become easy as soon as they become clear uh as soon as you become excited about the thing again then you, you go back to pushing it up that's that's how i tend to frame it yeah. And that's sort of what I've been doing this week because like, so we have family in town. So I've been doing more of, you know, outside activities and stuff and less of the Kaggle competition. Um, but then, so that kind of happened. So that's sort of what I usually do. I try to take the time off and that happened he here and I had a great idea and I came back and implemented it. It did like way worse. Than my, and so it's just like another, <laughs> Oh, geez. you know, yeah. like it's, uh, my, my great insight was not a great insight. And so, yeah, it's made me kind of depressed about the, uh, this particular problem, but mm, I feel that what's the work that you're most excited about right now. If I, if I told you like, ah, oh, Chris, I've just bought you six hours today to work on whatever you want. 
uh, what what pops into your mind is something that would be very exciting. I think in the past that's been kind of competitions and uh, you know playing with your new computer or something. Is there is there a project that comes to mind that you'd be really jazzed about that the work the next steps feel easy and straightforward? Yeah, I mean, so uh, I. I could do another cow competition. I think that would be fun. Um, the I, I, I want to do more of this learning. I'm sort of halfway through a basic linear algebra course online um, in preparation for my advanced linear algebra course that's coming up. So mm -hmm. I can do some of that. Um, and so, yeah, once... So my wife's sister leaves in two days. And so I'll probably... Um, I, I So I, I feel bad starting a new competition though because i know i'll get sucked in and i have more work to do i'm like you know <laughs> prepping and and then i mean there's still um work i could be doing to uh, i don't know i'm sort of dancing around this in my head trying to figure out what what exactly the work is that i want to do probably go on this picnic today and, and then and then take stock after that i i have been uh whenever i get in this situation i'll do something I'll get off on weird tangents. And so recently I've been looking at the price of land around me, which is a, <laughs> a terrible idea, but it's like, I mind, you know, maybe I should buy a farm <laughs> and just go, you know, like, uh, I think people have that, those thoughts, uh, by the way, the price of land in Indiana is really, really cheap. Um, Ooh. especially, especially if there's no water and electricity on the, on the plot, like yeah, it's, yeah. it's like super cheap land. Um, but that is exactly the wrong move for me, but I like thinking about it. So, yeah, that's, very funny you bring that up because that's like one of my active projects that i jump between is trying to figure out i really want to make a commune and i think the best way to do that is going to be either like the easiest way but the most expensive way i think would be just buying up houses in the same neighborhood but a uh, much more complicated and in some ways easier way would be buy undeveloped land and then put a bunch of tiny houses on it and then it's very modular and i can do some fun creative stuff of like i have my one central room and the one central room is like the game room and the really nice kitchen and like the laundry area and you can put a movie theater in there or something uh all the stuff that in the area around where i grew up uh <laughs> you have these mcmansions with dedicated rooms for things that no one ever uses i had i had a friend growing up who uh his his dad did something in software and just made so much money and they bought a house in west lake which is the same neighborhood as the uh jonas brothers lived in for a time and may still live mm -hmm. in i'm not sure and uh they had a room in their house dedicated to gift wrapping it was a gift wrapping room <laughs> and there was like uh, gift wrap on the walls and there was like the scissors and it was like tables with little grids so it made it easier to gift wrap like I, you couldn't possibly be wrapping so many gifts to justify a room in your house for gift wrap. My God. So, but like, that's the sort of thing that you can start to make sense if you have, I don't know, 20 people. Okay, sure. Maybe we have a room specifically for gift wrapping then. Uh, it would be a small room and like, maybe it would be a, a general purpose craft room, but uh, the, the percent use of that room would be much higher with more people than it would be with single people. So, uh, or, or a single family. And I think the same thing would apply to like uh, uh, media room. A, a bunch of the houses here have like a, a theater room. And it's such a joke because like you use it for the first month you're in the house and then you use it like six more times that year and then you never use it again. Uh, and it's this, it's an entire room in your house being heated and cooled and it's, it's obscene. Uh, but if you're in a community, okay, that thing can start to make sense. And now instead of this room being used you know, 0.0001% of the time that you're in this house, we'll multiply that out by 20 people. And now, well, if it's that low, that, that would still be obscenely low. <laughs> but, uh, you, you get the idea. The more people, yeah. the, the more you can start to justify that sort of thing. So pulling that back, I think that's one of your projects. <laughs> I think that's like in, in the same way that Da Vinci, uh, you know, would balance between these seemingly unrelated things if he's painting and then he's sculpting and then he's inventing the helicopter. Uh, that's the sort of thing that, yeah, that's that's a very interesting problem. Buying land and uh, starting a farm on it, like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm I'm saying this to you because I think I feel guilt in myself when I start doing these sorts of projects, and I'm, I'd I'd like to get to a space where like that's okay. I'm I'm a multi varied person, and I'm going to jump between projects, and I can't really control where my attention is going to be directed. The best thing I can do is like surf that wave, and like, okay, brain, you really want to know about comma ai and self-driving cars and that's the only thing you want to watch videos about that's that's the thing i really want to ask you about later by the way uh fine let's let's watch videos about this for the next six hours and let's get one of these development kits and let's like learn everything there's to know about uh, that stuff like it, it, 
properly allocating my time, trying to trying to frame this as I am my most valuable resource, and I'd like to be directing it towards the uh, most enjoyable and highest output way. Like the time that you spent researching land, I think during that time, because that's a thing you were really passionate about, that's a thing you were curious about. Like, yeah, that's how I would allocate your time. That makes sense to me. Go research land. That's a very interesting problem. And <laughs> you know, we are not merely software developers. We we make stuff. And making a farm would be super cool. Yeah, that's kind of how I framed it too. Um, I think I give myself permission to research all I want, uh, as long as I don't actually buy anything <laughs> or do <laughs> do anything silly. You know, don't don't do anything silly. Um, uh, that that's kind of been my motto. Um, yeah, but uh, I think your idea, yeah. So buying houses in, in like a neighborhood for you for your idea would be quite expensive compared to the tiny house idea. Um, because I think so. You're talking about building. You you like the idea of building one too so you get your plot of land you build the tiny houses right there and then you go park it on the thing and then the other thing you could do with that is you could buy land that other developers won't touch because yes. um tiny houses don't need the same permits they don't need permanent structures and so like as long as you had a portion of your land that was developable 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 for the you know warehouse or whatever you have uh, you yep. know um then you can go park the tiny house on a different plot part of the land yep. so uh yeah that'd be that'd be pretty cool cool Thank you. I think that's the game. Uh, you, you're welcome to come down. I'll have a little guest tiny house that you can, I can awesome. uh, have people come in. My my long term ploy is like invite a bunch of people to stay and then have such an awesome commune that I'm like, you know, you could just keep living in that guest <laughs> tiny house. I can I can just yeah. make another one, or I can custom make you one if, if there's like a, a different thing that you want. Uh this this feels like a pretty good transition into comma AI. Uh, because unlike you who has uh, uh who who is able to enforce the rule like as long as you don't buy anything that's fine uh i did not do that with comma ai <laughs> uh comma ai for anyone who doesn't know is a open source software and hardware package to be able to install self-driving capabilities in most modern cars they support like 100 different vehicles right now for about $1,000, you can take this kit and you, you just unplug a few wires uh, by your rear view mirror. If you, you have to have like a camera pre-installed uh, for lane keep assist. Uh, you have to have adaptive cruise control. You, so you, you plug a wire in there uh, so that this device is like man in the middling attacking the, the camera feed. And then you take another wire and you snake it down into the OBD2 connector uh, underneath your steering wheel, usually to the left side. And you stick this screen that's basically just an Android phone uh, on your window. And then your car can drive itself. <laughs> and like, oh my God. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> the future is amazing. This is, we're, I, we're living in the singularity right now. This is incredible. Everyone should have one of these if your car supports it. Wow, amazing. I love that this exists. Uh, second, the, the rabbit hole that I went down in this uh, that led me eventually to making this thousand dollar splurge for my girlfriend's car because my car doesn't even support it. I just really want to like play with this thing. Uh, George Hotz, the the founder of this company, is just a weird dude, and I love him. He's he's so matter of fact and like uh, <laughs> this. I don't know if this is a fair way to characterize him, but it's it's how I conceptualize it. He's he's like on the same sort of level on the autistic spectrum as people that i really like interacting with he's just very like blunt and rude and like he'll just say things matter of factly he just trashes traditional automakers and it's hilarious uh he's like you know we have more data on their cars than they ever will because we're actually logging it and, you know we understand how software works and we're pushing over the air updates and uh that's you know there's like two other companies in the car industry that are able to push over the air updates um so I, I have several related questions to this uh, that I'd, I'd love to chat with you about. Uh, the first sort of being like, wh what what do you know about comma AI and the the techniques that they're using as compared to Tesla? And like, what's your what's your hot take on that as a company uh, in general and a, and an approach to solving the self driving car problem? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I have several thoughts. The um, so George Hotz, like you said, he uh, he rubs people the wrong way very often. <laughs> He's uh, <laughs> extremely antagonistic towards, uh, especially the yeah, traditional automakers. Um, which makes him an interesting character, I suppose. Yeah, um, and and he's the only one really it, that I know. Kama AI is the only one doing this kind of open source, um, you know, at least commercially available open source um, 
self-driving. Uh, they are doing they're similar to Tesla in many ways. Um, they're similar because you don't have to install, like Tesla doesn't use LiDAR, which most other self-driving does. Kama AI mm -hmm. doesn't use LiDAR. Um, and so in that way, they're like sort of similarly betting on vision as the, the way to drive cars versus mm -hmm. other other things. Um, they're different because, so Kama AI is, like you mentioned, they're en it's an end-to-end -end machine learning thing, whereas Tesla has several different machine learning models um, that they cut, sort of combine in smart ways to do their self-driving. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, eh, and I could talk more about in detail about that if you want, but it's, it's very interesting. So self-driving from Kama AI, as far as I understand, it works great until it doesn't. And mm -hmm. so as long as you are you know, like, it is not the kind of self-driving where you can just, you know, ignore it, uh, and just fall asleep or something because, mm -hmm. um, just watch out. But other than that, like it sounds neat, <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I'd be very excited to hear what your experience is with it. Um, I'm very interested in how Kame AI supports so many different cars because, you know, like, uh, cars are going to respond differently to, you know, different, like you can't, you can turn a sedan faster than you can turn like a truck or whatever, you know? Mm. So, um, how, how is the experience? Do they tailor it to different cars? That's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. So it, I can go down any of those rabbit holes if you want. Several different things to, to, uh, bounce off of there. The, uh, the, uh Yes, you can't just ignore this. We're not yet at the stage where you just plug this in and you, you know you're in your driveway and you say, "Ah, take me to Chipotle," and or you know drive me down to Austin, and uh, it'll be able to navigate out of your driveway and and like on and off ramps. We're not there yet. Uh, this is my understanding of it is similar to Tesla's autopilot, Open Pilot, the name of this open source software package from Kama AI, is like a really good cruise control. Uh, you, you get it on the highway and you say open pilot engage and it can, uh, keep you in the lane and it can steer and it can do some clever things that require some thought, uh, of like George Hodge has this great quote of, you know, that the capacity of the computer that's doing this right now is sort of like the brain of a, an ant, I think. Uh, and if you could get it up to the, to a mouse, if you can get the hardware up to that, it's like the capacity of a mouse, then you could have fully end to end. Uh, but right now it's, it's very good cruise control. Uh, and you can even like turn on your turn signal, I think, and it'll switch lanes for you, which is a very complicated problem. Uh, and I think it can also exit and I'm unclear on if it understands stop lights. Uh, but yes, for, you know, I'm spending a thousand dollars on this. I, uh, I will be paying very close attention to it. Uh, the slogan of the company is, uh, make driving chill, which is like, you know, you, you don't have to be focused on all the minutia of micro adjustments in the steering wheel and micro adjustments in the pedal. Uh, you can just be more chill about it. You can just like sort of sit there listen to your audiobook and like watch the road and, uh, be ready to intervene. But, uh, they're at the point now where on average, there's only one intervention per hundred miles. That sounds reasonable. That sounds like, yes, I'm, I'm getting at least a hundred dollars of value from this. Uh, so yes, don't ignore it. You ask a very good question of how they support so many cars in interviews that I've watched with him. He talks about how, uh, because they're able to take this really weird path of making it open source. Like that's not the play if you're trying to maximize money, but that is the play if you're trying to like solve the problem of self-driving cars. Uh, my understanding of their approach is just like someone with a little bit of understanding of how the software packages are playing together, not necessarily any understanding of the, the underlying AI. If you have a car that could be supported by this, that's not, you can just fork the source code and then add your own car to it. Uh, and hmm. I think that's how they've been able to, to support so many cars. Brilliant move. And like only a move that someone like, like George Hotz could do, like Tesla could not do that. Uh, other auto manufacturers could not do that. If you're a Honda or a Toyota and you wanted to make this play, like you got to keep it closed source. You got to make it in house because you're playing this as it's a, it's a competitive advantage for you, uh, compared to other auto manufacturers. He's not doing that. He's just like this, <laughs> this force of anarchy, just like everyone should have a self-driving car and here is my open source software project. So you can figure out how to do it. Uh, which speaks to the testament of just like how amazing is, is ML and artificial intelligence. Um, in talking about this, I was struck by all of the tools that he's using are tools that you've talked about on the show of like, when I ask you, you know, how, how are you solving this problem with the GPS or how are you doing this, uh, 
you know image or, or sound classification or something it's like pytorch and tensorflow and that's what he is using it's the same stuff uh and that's amazing so i'm i'm very jazzed about uh learning more from you from like this uh linear algebra course and following more in your footsteps of uh learning more of these techniques this is this is some cool stuff we're th this is the first time that i think ml problems have not only looked tenable like okay the, i feel like i could reasonably do something like this but also very useful that i can see a problem for it that makes a lot of sense um so i guess I, I, is that is this a thing that like based on the skills that you have i imagine you could just jump into this project and like further development of this if it's open source i have i have very loose understanding of how uh ml works i, I think the way he describes it, there's just like a big binary blob of the weights of the network or something. And uh, how, what does that look like? If you were going to jump into that as a Git project, how, I'm, I'm yeah. very unfamiliar with how this sort of software development works. Yeah. So um, there's two, three, maybe big chunks of any ML project. Um, so the first and the most important is actually getting all the data. So the, like the actual algorithms, like the PyTorch that you're talking about, TensorFlow algorithms are sort of, they're, like they're almost secondary to getting all this data, um, which a lot of people don't quite understand when they first get into like AI stuff. Um, so most of the hard work, especially in self-driving, is getting you know like if if you want if you want to be able to avoid you know obstacles in the road, you have to see lots of obstacles in the road, and mm -hmm. then you can sort of train it to how to go, how to go around them or whatever. Um, and that's just a really difficult problem. That's one of the ways that this being open source really helps because all of their they're collecting all this data now that can be used to um train the more models so hmm. yeah data collection actually is the most important part and that requires no ai experience at all like you can collect data however you want um and you know then later you feed it into your model hmm. uh from the model perspective um yes so you the actual model is just a bunch of numbers which are weights and biases right and um they are like basically you have your inputs and they get multiplied and added and stuff and that's your model and then it gets outputted but you don't program those weights and biases instead you sort of you tell it the structure the general structure it's going to have and then you feed it all those examples and it learns all those weights and biases itself so it actually it learns all those numbers so you never actually go in and like tr touch those numbers um but yeah the model itself is just a bunch of numbers and then um and then the second part is now that you get this model output like what do you do with it or sorry the third part i guess and so and that's not ai either you know that is you know your ai says you should turn a little bit to the left uh yeah. you know what does that mean for the car so there's this whole like integration kind of piece like how do you actually get the car to turn left um and so those are sort of the three big sections and only the middle part is ai and it's it's kind of a narrow part really uh like the data collection is super hard making sure you know the car turns left and only a little bit and not like you know veers off the road um are all super difficult problems that are have nothing to do with the AI part. You've just made something click for me of uh, it's not as big of a deal as I thought that it's open source because the source that's open is the declarative programming like integration part and this is a different style of programming in the same way that you have you know imperative and declarative and functional this like ai ml is a different type of programming where it sounds like the valuable piece of it is in the m data and then the model that the data is consolidated into so for in that context for for an ai project to be open source it, it seems like the data that it's trained on would also need to be public you, you can publish the method of how to train the data but unless you're using the same data you're going to get to a totally different result and i don't think they're doing that uh and yeah i think they have just massive amounts of data so that's that's where the actual meat of this is that's very interesting yeah and not just the data so this is exactly what's happening with open ai and gpt3 right now so gpt3 they actually published the paper that is exactly what gpt3 is doing and so you can go and recreate the model exactly um but what they didn't publish was that binary blob of weights and biases um mm -hmm. And so, and so they didn't publish the actual model. They just published how to do it. So people have recreated exactly how to do it. The problem is OpenAI spent millions of dollars training the model, like mm -hmm. getting all, running all this data through it. So even if you had the data and you, which is, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data and you had their model, which they published exactly, you'd still have to spend the millions of dollars to actually train the model, um, to get that, the, 
you know the numbers that are the actual model um so yeah the valuable part is the the actual the actual model the trained model how fascinating that they effectively have a binary blob that's worth millions of dollars <laughs> that like yeah it's it's it, they made a little brain and that that brain now can take input and it's trained to have output that can be a, a story like you publish on Twitter. How amazing. Do we know how big the binary blob is? Is it like gigabytes yeah. or terabytes or? Um, they publish the number of parameters. And so it kind of like parameters are just numbers. And so it depends mm -hmm. on like their their floating point, like what, how much precision they're using and stuff. But I think it's, let's see, how many parameters in GBT3? So there's 175 billion parameters. So that's 175 wow. billion float floating point numbers. Okay. Um, yeah. So it depends a little bit about how they're storing it, but yep. I think if my conversions are roughly correct, I think that's gigabytes. Probably. Yeah. Sounds right. Okay. I'll I'll do the math later. I might be off by several orders of magnitude. That's amazing. Wow. Cool. And like. I think it's the same thing for uh, Open Pilot. They're except they're publishing their blob, uh, but they're not publishing the data. So I I suppose like if we wanted to go in and make a better version of Open Pilot, it sounds like what that would look like is okay. We we have the source code of what their parameters are, so that's a good starting point of like what the uh, how how they're formulating this problem. How many Okay, this this is a question that I have for you because this is something I don't understand about AI and ML. What are you actually doing when you're when you're <laughs> making uh, a, a, when you're solving a problem with ML? Like most of the work, it sounds like is just you've it's the computer doing the work. It's the computer looking at all the data and you've told it what the loss function is, and it's just trying to jiggle all the different weights around to try to minimize the loss function. What are you doing in that process? Are you like? Are you changing the number of layers and are you changing like the number of nodes and are you giving it initial starting conditions when I'm, I'm, I'm very lost when you say that, you know, you, you've tried different approaches to the problem of your uh, GPS uh, question on Kaggle. Like, what are those approaches? Like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> you can clean the data and I understand that. That would be something very yep. like, declarative and you, you could transform the data into something that might be easier for an AI or ML thing to understand. But I don't know what programming in ML looks like. Uh, what? <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> yeah. So so there's two different things. Uh, one is for the Cal competition, one of the reasons I'm sort of stuck is because um, the stuff I'm stuck on is not AI stuff. It's not ML stuff. Um, okay. It is... So it's GPS data, and it's just trying to. It, it's kind of the, in the cleaning data step. It's it's well, not really. It's it's kind of confusing, and I don't want to say too much because it's an active cattle competition. So I'll put that. I'll start with that. But um, I'm not stuck on the AI stuff. I'm stuck on just traditional programming stuff. Um, and like, there's lots of different ways you can handle GPS data, and I'm I've tried like all of them, and they just produce worse results than the benchmark. And so I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, mm. And so yeah, that is stuck on a non AI thing. But back to the what you're actually doing for machine learning or for AI. Yeah, so there's a few different steps. So you have all your data, right? Say you have all your data and you know what you want the output to be. Um, the first thing you have to do is pick a model architecture or pick a model. And okay. there are many different ones, um, including, so there's so sort of like neural networks and then non-neural network based stuff. There's lots of non-neural network based architectures, but say you want to do neural networks, then what you're deciding is stuff like the number of layers, the number of neurons per layer, um, a lot of stuff is called feature engineering. So you have all your data, right? But only some of the data may be useful. Some of the data may be more useful if combined in certain ways or like, uh, or separated in certain ways or used in different ways. And so a lot of what you're doing is like looking at the data you do have and saying, is there some smart way I can do this? Because so theoretically a neural network that's wide enough and or deep enough can figure everything out about your model, mm. but that's with infinite data, infinite time and, and stuff like that. So if you can prep the data in a way that like helps the network, um, then you can get way better results without infinite data and infinite time. So it's like kind of prepping the data, find, doing feature engineering. Um, then once you have all that set up, so that's all this, you know, you program your model, you know, kind of what you want. 
then you actually train the thing. And training is a whole process where you feed in the data and it's not like you can just hit go. Um, there are some things that make it easier where you can just hit go, but you have to, like you mentioned, like maybe you have better initial starting conditions than purely random. Uh, then you have a loss function you have to decide and you have to figure out how many epochs to train it. You have to figure out, do I add noise? Do I, you know, so there's lots of techniques to try to get the loss function down. Yeah. Um, then once you do that, you say, okay, I did all that. Can I do better with a different model? And you try it all again with a different model. Mm. Um, there are, so if all, that all sounds like a lot of work, it is like training is a lot of work. That's not programming work, right? Um, there are uh, categories of things called, called auto ML. So auto machine learning, which tries to do all that for you. So you basically, you say, here's all my data, uh, try lots of different things and tell me the best results. Um, and those work. Uh, the problem is the same thing. Like uh, those can run for, you know, days and days and days and days and maybe only have, you know, a few hours or, or that would be too expensive, right? So a company with millions of dollars, sure, they can just tell AutoML to, to run forever. But um, if you are smarter about your inputs and models, then you can reduce that time drastically. How cool. Okay, thank you. Th this is starting to make much more sense. Um, I love especially the idea that if you had infinite depth uh, and breadth of your network and infinite data, you could just say, you know, solve this problem and uh, have a, I guess that's what general intelligence would be. Uh, you, you can just say, here's any arbitrary problem and it's able to figure it out. But we are limited technologically in this moment in time. So humans need to still do a little bit of work of figuring out, okay, we can only have brains the size of an ant running this. Uh, oh, the analogy I would draw is like, you know, back in the Atari days, all the hacks we had to do with memory and like reusing different bytes and you, you had to be very economical and uh, it was very much an engineering challenge to be able to fit a game inside of whatever, <laughs> 12 bits that they had at the time to, to work with games or whatever the ridiculous uh, small amount of memory there was. So yeah. that's what I'm hearing is that's that's the stage that we are in ML. Our, our capacity to uh, train these networks is limited. So we have to be making some heuristics for the machine, helping it of like, this problem looks like this category of problem that this type of model is very good at. So, uh, you know, don't waste your time with all the potential models you could do in something like auto ML. Like this is probably gonna give you the best results. And then, uh, you know, as a human, I can see whatever this, the GPS coordinates are in the special GPS format, but I know based on this model, it's going to like it much better if instead of a string comma separated, it needs these as two separate parameters and it needs them whatever normalized so that they're positive floats. And, uh, you can, you can massage the data a little bit to, to be, uh, to maximize the chances that the model is going to be able to understand it and, key into the features that you think are probably the most interesting for it to actually solve the problem. Is that right? Yeah. So that's all generally correct. Yeah. I mean, there's even for your Atari example, there's a direct corollary right now, which is like, say you want to run inference on a phone. So say you want like to actually get the model on the phone so that you don't have to go to the cloud every time. Right. Um, you don't want to download like a two gigabyte model to your phone. So there's a bunch of work right now. That's like, how can we take this, you know, 175 billion 32 bit floats and can we make that, you know, 50 billion four bit integers, you know, like, hmm. um, and so there's, there's a whole, that's a whole other branch of work, which is like, how do you make your models smaller and still have it? You're not going to have as good accuracy, but similar accuracy. Um, so yeah. That, that how interesting. Also. And that would be, that's the problem of like, okay, we've already trained this network with the, mm -hmm. the beefiest, strongest computer we have and thrown millions of dollars at the problem. Now we have the brain. We, we figured out what the structure of the brain is and what the different weights are between the nodes can we compress that more so that it can run on your phone? And I guess that's been done with things like um, speech to text. Would that be a good example of, I think that's like a 300 megabyte uh, blob that Android downloads to be able to uh, run that offline. Is that the sort of thing? Yeah, that... spe yep, speech to text. Um, probably the most famous one is uh, image classification or image recognition. Um, there are uh, image recognition you know, blobs out there that are gigabytes big. Um, but then there's also one called MobileNet, which is like 20 megabytes that does Wow. Not as well, but but pretty good. For 20 yeah. megabytes, my gosh. <laughs> I'll take that. Oh, I'm reminded also of in Android uh, on the Pixel series, it can recognize songs playing in the background. Mm -hmm. And I think it was an option when I was setting up my phone of, uh, you know, do you, do you want this? And it was some ludicrously small binary that it was downloading to recognize every song. <laughs> Like, yeah. the, how can you even fit the data of the, the song titles in uh, a, a 
small enough package or something like that. Uh, so for, for that, I for for the actual song titles, I thought it went out to the network. I could be wrong there, but um, that one's interesting because that's based on Shazam, right? And they don't use AI; they use like a more traditional ML method, which is really interesting. Um, mm. There's a way you can kind of fingerprint the song, and then you can kind of slide its fingerprint back and forth and try to see if it matches these other uh, songs. So yeah, that's this totally separate thing but that's an interesting non-ai uh sort of or non-deep learning you know kind of machine learning uh thing this is a great time to ask you this question uh what's the difference between ml and ai (laughs) yeah so i just did a presentation about this actually and um (laughs) so uh yeah okay so there whenever you hear someone say ai they mean something and you have to figure out what they mean and everyone means something slightly different (laughs) so there is kind of a traditional like like cs version of what this all is um but then okay so i'll I'll give this spiel all right so you have ai ai was invented around the 50s or so ai can mean everything from you know deep learning neural networks like super advanced stuff that we have today to back then which were basically like for loops and if statements right (laughs) like any like any sort of machine anything that looks like machine intelligence can be called ai machine learning is a particular subset of ai uh and machine learning is all about you set up these models so you set up this this um like the uh you 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 set up what i want to say other than model just you set up a model and then you run a bunch of data through it so the machine actually learns these weights this blob we're talking about by you running data through it and then you say you know yes or no basically so it starts with a completely random guess it runs something through you say yes or no and then it um updates its weights and you do that a lot and then you have a model deep learning is a very particular type of model machine learning model called a neural network and it's called deep because neural networks have layers. And if you have more than two layers, then it's deep. That's, that's all that means. Um, so there are a lot of machine learning models that are not neural networks, but deep learning is neural networks. Um, okay. Then when most people say AI today, they usually mean deep learning, uh, which is very confusing because AI is actually this umbrella term, but most people actually mean this very subset of it because called uh, deep learning. So hopefully that helps some. <laughs> Let me try to repeat the back and see if I understand. Uh, AI can mean anything. And yeah, at one point was made to, to like, I guess technically for loops are artificial intelligence. It's it's a machine <laughs> right. that was not biologically created following some sort of uh, intelligence. A subset of this very broad category of AI is machine learning. That is uh, this idea of you set up a model and you run data through it and it's tweaking the weights and biases to try to solve a, a problem. A subset of machine learning is deep learning, which is machine learning with multiple layers. Is that right? It's a particular kind of machine learning called neural networks. Okay. Yeah. That, the, the model, so neural networks are a particular type of model. There's other types of models that you could set up. Okay. Uh, machine learning can have different types of models uh, in order to, to have this problem of like you set up a model and run data through it. Uh, one of those types of models is called a neural network. And if ma- machine learning that uses neural networks is called deep learning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Okay. And when people yes. today are saying artificial intelligence, they're usually referring to deep learning. Yep. Got it. Okay. So going back, <laughs> um, Shazam <laughs> is probably using machine learning but not deep learning it's probably a a much more straightforward it's probably not using neural nets probably just using some sort of a sliding fingerprint uh still this general technique of like you set up a model and you run data through it but not not a neural net is that right so the the original shazam there's actually a paper out it so so you can actually read exactly what they did and i think it wasn't even using machine learning i think it was using a more general form of ai a deterministic kind of form of ai okay because AI is this broader subset. So that, that could mean, yeah. it could be for loops. They, it's just an <laughs> algorithm. Just, right. Any okay. algorithm. <laughs> yep. Got it. How fascinating. Man, I'm I'm starting to get excited about this. I see I see why you want to be spending more time and energy specifically in artificial intelligence. Because like, which, okay, that's that's not a good term. Because uh, that's just like <laughs> programming. Uh, in, in deep learning. I see why you want to be spending more time in uh, deep learning and, and neural networks. This is another paradigm of coding. And like, in the same way that functional programming is sort of mind bending and lets you solve different types of problems, like th- my gosh, deep learning lets you drive cars with a computer. And as the capacity of computers 
continues to go up like okay we don't need to run for loops any faster we, we've we've kind of solved that problem and i guess there's some interesting things in quantum computing uh especially in cryptography but like this is this is the wild west of computing this is where it feels like the the huge advances in what computers are able to do better than humans is is going to be in any sort of arbitrary problem that a human is currently good at like you know uh, it, it it seems like as soon as, as as soon as George Hotz is satisfied that he's solved this problem of cars can drive themselves now, he could just as easily turn his attention to like, let's get rid of all accountants and <laughs> let's let's make a let's make a neural net that's going to do all of accounting for all of humanity forever. Uh, or I think a problem he's actually interested in is like law. If you could just make law procedural, well, that might that problem might be better solved by just having contracts that are programs instead of uh, having things that lawyers need to interpret. But the, 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 the general problem of we have a human that currently needs to decide based on some input what the output is going to be. Uh, it seems like the best tool in coding to be able to solve that problem is currently and will continue to be and will only get more powerful uh, deep learning and uh, making neural networks. Uh, that's yeah. very exciting. I think you're investing yeah. your time and attention in a uh, very good direction. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. Um, it's also why, so a lot of people think, for example, because so self-driving cars are sort of a very visible like front of AI, um, a lot of people think like drivers, like truck drivers are going to get replaced first. Um, yeah. Actually, I think, and a lot of people now think, it like anyone who does any work in front of a computer is, is at risk of getting replaced, including lots of programmers, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Because driving is, is really hard uh, f and, you know, don't believe all the hype basically because as soon as you get like say common ai has one you know they get 99.999 percent accurate but then someone mm -hmm. runs into a stop truck right which is kind of yeah. what happened to tesla um it sets them back you know like a whole year or something like like, like their self-driving has a lot of problems that say accounting right doesn't um now accounting and lawyers specifically they have like uh, regulations so you got to get laws rewritten if you want ai lawyers but um yeah anyone who does any kind of work on a computer can be done probably by a computer at some point. Uh, this is something I've been thinking about a lot more recently of like, yeah, it. <laughs> we, there, there was this movement of like learn to code, which then turned into a meme of, uh, you know, okay, not everyone can learn to code and uh, you're you're out of touch for even suggesting that someone who was a truck driver can go get a, a career uh, coding. My perspective on that is flipped. I, th I agree with you now that like, I think the safer job is a truck driver because anything that has to happen in the real world like robotics seems like it has much further to go and moves slower than ai does so anything that needs to happen in the real world of like being an electrician or oh i had uh internet installed in a uh house that i'm renting a couple days ago and my gosh the number of things that this th that these two guys did to install internet it's going to be uh, uh, <laughs> 50 years before a computer can do that unless it's it becomes much more systematized but like just looking at the the physical things they were doing like they they knocked on my door and they said hello and they asked where the attic was and they crawled up in the attic and they were doing stuff outside connecting these fiber optic cables and uh they were lifting stuff and they used this machine to find the wire in the wall and they drilled a hole through the wall and they cut out a thing for it and they installed a thing like these are very complicated technical skills um that that need a lot of dexterity that uh, i'm not seeing as much promise of that this is going to be something very easily automated as I am with anything done on a computer. If, if a person's job is, you know, they're looking at a screen and they're taking input from the screen and then their, their output is something that they're typing. Okay. We have trivially solved that interface for computers. If you know, that's, if you're interacting with a spreadsheet, like great, I, I, that's, that's a thing you can do with a Python script. Uh, so while the, the intellectual complexity of something happening uh, on a computer is much more complicated than I'm sure what the, these dudes from uh, AT&T did at my house the other day. Uh, you know, like functionally, if I was to explain what happened, like, okay, they, they connected these wires to this box and then they connected this other wire to this other box uh, and, you know, they plugged it in. <laughs> that's that's not conceptually complicated at all. Uh, but the, the interface for being able to do what they were doing was very technically, mechanically precise and needed a lot of dexterity. Uh, it, it's sort of surprising to me now that maybe the human advantage 
for the next couple of years is going to be our our mechanical dexterity. Maybe, maybe we're going to get pushed back into like these technical jobs um, and just have computers doing all the thinking for us. And it turns out the the most uh, economically valuable place for a human to be spending their time, at least for a little while, is is in like you know grocery delivery. <laughs> it's it's really hard to have <laughs> right. a robot that can drop off groceries at your door. Uh, and the, the computers are just doing all the thinking. Yeah, it's a, it's a wild idea that my my perspective on that is completely flipped from a couple of years ago. I used to think that truck drivers were the, the industries to be the most concerned. And now I think it's like, you know, secretaries and, and accountants and uh, anyone who's doing a job entirely at a computer. Yep. Yeah. I mean, robotics, like for all the cool things like Boston Robotics puts out, uh, robotics are they're very expensive. They take a long time to develop, uh, and we're yeah nowhere nowhere near close to having a robot that can climb in your attic and go in your basement and drill through a wall. And you know that's we're nowhere nowhere near that. Yeah, yeah. How interesting! Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, and I think eventually we're going to get there. Like <laughs> Boston Dynamics, especially if it's led by you know uh, deep neural network researchers who are able to iterate the hardware instead of uh, human engineers, because the engineers making those like. They have the type of job that's just interacting with the screen. Uh, yeah. We're we're going to get there eventually, and uh, I'm I'm curious to see uh, how humans choose to spend their time when like they don't need to be doing any work. Yeah. Well, so so uh, Boston Dynamics has a very interesting story because for a long time, and I don't know about now, but for a long time they had no deep networks at all. It was all like it looks like something that should be like deep neural network powered, but it wasn't. It was just regular algorithms, um, and so all the advancements in AI didn't help their robotics at all and then mm. google tried this thing where they tried to simulate a bunch of stuff so OpenAI did the same thing OpenAI actually just defunded their robotics uh arm uh, because they sort of came to the same conclusion like they they had great advancements in it but it's like you can move so much faster in the sort of brain part of it it just doesn't mm. even make sense right now uh, at least for them to to you know try to apply ai to robotics so that's yeah, fascinating think, yeah. and so counterintuitive because i would think Okay, figure out how to make an arm in a, a, a computer, and this is something that I saw people in like their senior design projects at my university do. Uh, they, they would make like an arm with three different articulating things and a little hand or something. Uh, I would think the problem would be as straightforward as have your loss function defined as I don't know. Did you get the ball in the hoop, or at least close to the hoop, and give this thing some eyes so it can see how close it got and then tell it how to send commands to all the motors and I don't know maybe have some sensory feedback of it knows the position of all the motors I would think then you just say okay run that a million times is the, is the problem in that if it's purely in software you can do it much faster and that we would need to set yep. up like a thousand of these things so that it's it's getting the iterations in yeah exactly so say so you have to do it a million times and it's you know it sounds like you're making a basketball shooting robot then you have to make a million shots how long is it going to take you know years right mm. um if you saw so i think was it mark rober who made this the dartboard that could move and you always get a bullseye yeah, yeah um that's the same type of thing he just used a regular algorithm for that like basically exactly what you said like this dart is coming in you know move this here so that it hits the bullseye um the problem with that is every single algorithm is going to be different like mm. sure you have sort of general structures and stuff but every algorithm is different and so you're like by solving one problem, you're not necessarily solving another. Whereas if you did it with neural nets, you're getting closer to solving like all robotics problems at once. But the mm -hmm. problem is getting a million iterations of a robot, even if you make a thousand of them, getting a million iterations in the real world, is going to take forever. Um, and so like places like Google and OpenAI have tried simulations. They sort of work, but mm -hmm. turns out simulations don't simulate everything <laughs> about the real mm -hmm. world. Um, they're super, super difficult things. Even stuff like, you know, the way light hits objects, the way different objects are slippery or rough. Um, all of that is is like we don't we can't simulate that yet so yeah it's just anything you can simulate in a computer accurately goes way way faster this is so interesting i it seems like a successful model then would be something like what comma ai is doing of first try to solve the problem of getting a bunch of data so if you're trying to make the robot that can make baskets figure out some sort of product that you can sell to basketball players that's just going to be collecting data and has some sort of a benefit for them of i don't know maybe it's a thing that's scoring their baskets uh it, it's automatic counter and then if they if they get five in a row it automatically tweets it or something have some sort of a value for the, the end customer with the play being you're just trying to collect data you're just trying to get real world data as much as you possibly can of 
uh, how to uh, do the thing and uh, I don't know I'm imagining like you have sensors set up at every joint and you're you're measuring just like how does this person move their arm and then figuring out if they made the basket or not and if you can put one of those data collecting devices on every single basketball player in the world now you can now you've effectively like simulated you have the data that you need to be able to make the AI portion of it uh, interesting and then yeah so this yeah, is, that's this why... is flipping on its head like the, the valuable part of software development for me because it's it's about the data. The data is the interesting thing. The... Yep. <laughs> huh. Yeah, and, and that's why it's so hard. Like, like the scenario you just described would cost like millions of dollars and take years, right? Yeah, Whereas sure. if you wanted to do some image recognition stuff, you just write a script to download images and maybe it takes a couple of days, but then you have all your images, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and so it's just, it's like orders of magnitude easier to do software things and hardware things. It seems like a major breakthrough in this is going to be have a minimum viable robot that's somehow able to collect data of how it should be doing things. So that could be. Um, there's problems with that, though, too. So Baxter is one made by, uh, I think, the same guy who did iRobot, the, the you know, Roomba, um, mm-hmm. made this thing called Baxter. It was like a, it was kind of this. It was like a minimum viable robot for manufacturing. It was like super easy to move and all the stuff. And they, they were, su- it was super hyped. Like, this is the next wave of stuff. And they went bankrupt. Like, they, they wow. could not they sell enough of these things. Um, yeah, so it's, hardware is hard. Okay, here's my idea from this podcast. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you make a, a minimally useful household robot that, I don't know, it, it's, it passes the butter. <laughs> and I have it set up in such a way that, like, the human can teach it how to do a thing, or maybe it can watch the human to see how it's doing the thing. And yeah. the, the principal thing it's doing is just collecting more data. And then that's then the data that you train the neural net on. And then you apply that to the hardware. And then it's, you're, it's like teaching all of them anytime you teach one of them. Yeah. So I've thought about this actually a lot. Um, probably five, six years ago, I thought about this for like a long time. Uh, the way you do it and the way people have tried sort of, it still takes a lot of money, but you make these robots, right? And then you remote control them. And so that's a whole mm. other thing. So you, remo- you oh, have someone remote course. control the robot. Right. And then the robot is learning as the person actually remote control it. The problem is that still t- takes a lot of money because you still need, yeah. you know, to pay a bunch of people to remote control stuff. Now you can, you know, you can make money from it or whatever, but yeah, so it's still hard, but yeah, that's how you do it. Make a robot and then you remote control it. That's perfect. That's, that's exactly the solution because now your input is in the same language as your output is. Yep. So, and then you, you, the, the labor on that, you could take advantage of uh, just, you know different different economies you know have people in the philippines or whatever uh be the the backbone behind these virtual robot assistants and then i'm talking to it and i'm talking to a person and i say like hey could you pass the butter and there's a person on the other end of that robot uh and you set it up in a you know a way that it makes sense for there to be a human there like they're getting paid enough and uh you know they <laughs> they have a cool robot suit or something that they're controlling it from uh but then they're using their human intelligence and the limited capabilities of the hardware of this machine. And then you're effectively training the neural net on like, what was the command? And then what were the outputs from that command? And you have cameras and you have the position of the motors and how all that was doing. That's perfect. That's exactly what needs to happen. Oh, how interesting. And yeah, then there's they even move the robot around. There's even different stages that you can go through too, which is you, so the first stage is the person actually moves the robot hand, right? And remote controls the robot hand, whatever. The second stage is um, you have object recognition. And so pass the butter is the person uses a tablet to click on the butter and then click on the person they're going to pass it to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the third stage is the robot hears pass the butter and says to the person, I think you want me to do this. Is that right? And the person now is just hitting yes or no, right? Yes. And so, yeah, you have even different stages to do it. Just cost a lot of money. Someone give me a billion dollars. Could probably make that happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what an interesting problem. How interesting. The the biggest unknown for that for me is how to get a robot that would do that. Like, I guess you could just use, you know, can, can we buy up all the inventory of the Baxter robots from <laughs> when, when that company went bankrupt and uh, yeah. just hook that up to, to Wi-Fi and then uh, hire some assistants. So, so there's huh. a robot that do, there is a robot that can do all that. Um, it's a kind of a research robot. I think it costs about two hundred grand. <laughs> so, oh, okay. 
yeah so, so you can the baxter robot's a lot cheaper but it can't move it's in one fixed position which is mm-hmm. why it was for manufacturing that seems to be a sticking point of this now then i think it, if there could be a minimum viable robot made for whatever uh, under five thousand dollars that then could have enough capability to make it make sense i could see that i could see that uh appealing to you know that the upper middle class markets of the world who in, in this position where like they can't they can't afford to hire a full-time butler or whatever but you know if, if they could be paying someone five dollars an hour to be doing these basic household chores because you can you could clean with that sort of thing and you could like prepare food i imagine and uh do basic tasks of things uh if the deal was okay spend five grand on this hardware and then for as many hours as you want it's five dollars an hour to do the tasks i think that would hit mass market appeal i think that the the problem there then and the biggest unknown is how you would make capable enough hardware for a, a reasonable price point yeah yeah and i mean we're getting there right so spot mini is boston dynamics like a uh, dog looking robot that's seventy five thousand. a company just came out with a twenty twenty seven hundred dollar version of that um and so that, that's the I'll kind of thing that you might just buy right uh, yeah um <laughs> it it doesn't have any arms so you gotta put an arm on it and so that costs money but right. yeah so that's we are getting to the point where some of those robotic platforms may be near a price that sort of makes sense uh, yeah. yeah yeah how fun oh man fantastic ideas explored today uh we're, we're at an hour so uh, yeah, i yeah. want to wrap up but i have one more thing i wanted to brag about a little bit uh <laughs> that seems just like trivial in the context of all this all this crazy stuff we've been talking about uh i did it on clips marketing i can render videos in the cloud now uh the ffmpeg rendering is unusually fast i don't know how it's so fast but looking at the render times like i don't know how it's so fast but it's faster than i would have predicted um and i came up with this beautifully flexible system of like i am i'm defining completely in data what the job is uh so i say like what the inputs are and an input an input to my cloud ffmpeg renderer is a url uh or an, an object in a bucket and i say like these are the inputs and these are the assets you need and then i can define any arbitrary ffmpeg command of like advanced filters and anything ffmpeg could do i define entirely in data and then i set up this universal function so that it looks at whatever the ffmpeg job is it has this step of like okay first i need to fetch all the assets and fetch all the inputs uh and it just downloads all those in parallel and translates translates those to a uh file path and then it compiles the filter of whatever the commands are that it needs to do uh substituting out the name of the asset for the path of the asset and then it renders it and then as part of that little job package that's entirely defined in the database uh i say what the output is and where i want the output stored and that little generic function just spits out the output and that feels really cool because now with no code changes i can completely change what the output is and what the what ffmpeg is doing uh so it's an incredibly flexible system and uh oh i I did want to ask you about what the next step of that would be uh because so so uh with about an hour more of work uh any of the clips that we've been making in clip stop marketing of the show i can make those social media affide videos of it uh what would you do next eventually i want this to be automatically flowing into twitter uh and i've, I've done work there like i know what that would look like um should i wait for doing that and make an automated system for pushing them out or should i just generate a bunch of those clips and manually queue them up in buffer first uh how, how would you be thinking about that uh what's what's your goal are you trying to save your own time or are you trying to get other people to pay money for something are you yeah what's, what's what are you trying to get out of this that's a very good question what is my I, goal i figured it uh, out first <laughs> <laughs> for this podcast i think it would be cool to be following this joe rogan style clipping uh long form content or like gary v also does this uh into shorter clips that then make it trivially easy for us to be publishing regular content i would love okay here, here's here's the most immediate goal i can think of i want to be publishing a social media optimized video every day on the uh twitter account we have for this podcast it, reliably 
with as little human work as I want. So I guess under that lens, it's not that much more work to just hook up the Twitter API and put that on a queue. Yeah, I'll just make it as happy as stuff is done. Make it as hacky as you want and just make it happen. And then you can kind of, that'll be a completed project and then you can kind of sit with that for a few weeks or months or whatever yes. and see how it feels. Cool. Okay, perfect. That is exactly what I'll do then. Thank you for the clarity. Uh, what's your goal? A very good question. <laughs> what, are you, what are you trying to do? <laughs> if you don't know that, you, you can't do it. Uh, neat, man, good talk. I'm very optimistic about the future and uh, AI. Uh, cool stuff. Chris, that's all I got. That's all I got too. Then I will see you next time.